Welcome to our Appalachia. My name is Phil Kahn. I'm your host for this series, and today we're going to talk about the development of medical services in Rowan County, Kentucky. We have my family doctor here today, Dr. Louise Caudill, so I can vouch for her knowledge of medical services. And as those of you who know Dr. Caudill are aware, she is a lifelong resident of Rowan County and goes back, I guess, many generations. So. You can not only tell us a great deal about medical services in this county, Dr. Caudill, you can tell us a lot about Round County in general. I told you I was going to let you take us through your development as a general practitioner because you have a very illustrious career, not only in medicine, but in education. And you've mixed the two so effectively. I'm going to let you tell us from the point you graduated from Round County High School how you kept both a career as an educator and as a doctor going. I don't know that it kept them both going, <laughs> but um, after I graduated from high school, I went to college. And um, I went up to Ohio State, and I didn't know what I was going to do up there because Mother didn't want me to go to medicine. She thought that was a man's job. So I was talking to this friend of mine, had to make a talk in class, and she says, I want to tell him how to serve a tennis ball. And she says, I just don't know how to do that. Will you help me? And I says, yeah. So I said, do you mean to say that you major in that in the college? And she says, yeah. And I says, well, if you can major in playing in college, I'm going to major in that. So I majored in physical education. And after I finished up my years there, I, uh, I came back to Moorhead and started in to school again. I was taking a little physics and a little chemistry to get ready to go to med school. And about that time, I got a job teaching in Moorhead mm -hmm. at the university. So then I went up to Columbia, and I thought I'd better be getting my master's if I was going to stay in teaching. And the more I got into the master's, I, the more I decided I wanted to go to med school. So then I went to Louisville and graduated down there about 1946 and came back home, went to work. Right. So you have been in general practice of medicine here in Ryan County since the late 40s. Right. And I understand that you're the first woman to practice medicine in Ryan County. Did the folks who came to see you, did they make any distinction between you and men doctors, or were doctors doctors in the late 40s? I believe doctors were pretty well always doctors. Well, certainly you've been Dr. Caudill to me since my family first started using your services. But I would say that a lot of people in the area did feel that the practice of medicine was a male domain back in the 40s. You've certainly proven that some of the best medical services can come at the hands of women. Certainly I can attest to that. What was your early practice in Rowan County? What types of things did a general practitioner do in the late 40s? You delivered babies. That was a big <laughs> business. And then, of course, you had the general run of things like wrecks and backaches and headaches and belly aches and cuts and broken bones. But a large part of your practice was child delivery. A lot of it. That's why I, I took a little time up in Oneida before mm -hmm. I came back home because I felt sure there would be a lot of baby business. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to a little hospital up in Clay County mm -hmm. and just delivered babies. Right. So your practice, 50, 60, 70 percent child delivery. Mm -hmm. And at that time, babies were delivered in the home. Yeah. I understand. So why don't you describe for us, those of us who are accustomed now to having our babies delivered in the hospital, or at least a clinic, Tell us about the work of a general practitioner who had to go to the home where the baby was to be delivered. How were you contacted? How did you take care of prenatal care? And what were some of the complications of delivering in a home situation? All of them were different. You never ran into the same situation twice. They, they, they didn't come that way. But it seemed like they most always started in the middle of the night. Right. And most of the time, somebody came and knocked on your door and said, well, Ms. So-and-so is down, and she needs some help. So she's been feeling bad since the early afternoon. And you'd try to ask all the questions you could and find out, was she really in labor or was she not? And uh, sometimes you could find out something, sometimes you couldn't. 
that you'd get in, drive. There were all kinds of problems there. Sometimes you couldn't get to where you were going. Uh, the first delivery we had was, how about that one? Right. <laughs> That's a good place to begin, right. I guess, that it was way out in the country. It was, the snow was deep as it could be. It was on the second day of February. So we drove as far as we could drive. And then we put our junk into a truck and they took us by truck for a, a few more miles. And then we got on a sled and we slid in to where the house was. And the house was very good. You could look any place and see the outside. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was really surprising. We'd been there about an hour or two before we found out there was another baby in the bed. Uh, that was the last one that was born last year. A baby alongside the mother in labor. In the, uh, and yeah. There was one that the father was holding in his lap. So we thought that was the youngest, but we found out that this other one, when you tried to get in to check her, that there was somebody else right. there. So that, uh, we stayed there all night and then had to make a call next door because the woman was having some kind of a headache or belly ache. So we went over there and came back. Finally, about noon the next day, she had her baby. We carried all of her junk with us. Mm -hmm. We carried a, a sterile pack. It wasn't the most sterile you can imagine, but it had been cooked in the oven. Mm -hmm. And uh, we carried all kinds of pads and carried our sterile instruments and so forth. So uh, we carried a table. And you could just fold it out, and it had two stirrups on it, so you could put their legs mm -hmm. up in it. Um, so your stirrups were on a table at the foot of the bed, but the baby was delivered from the uh, regular bed. Now you put this table on top of the bed, oh, and okay. it folded out like this, and you're on the side. Then the, the sides was this way. The woman went sideways on the bed mm -hmm. with her legs hanging over here. Okay. So you could put stuff down under here to catch the junk. Right, right. So but you really had to improvise, I guess, in terms of making a bedroom ready for the delivery of a child. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about working along with someone else, you generally took a nurse with you? I took Susie. She came here and started out with me. From the very beginning? First day. So you've delivered almost every child together, I guess. Yeah. How many children have you delivered in your course of medical practice? I, I usually say four or five. Four or five? Mm -hmm. I'd say that many at least. But would you say it runs in the thousands? Yeah. I have run into a lot of folks in this county that you've delivered. As a matter of fact, I remember at a commencement, I guess last year, they asked for all the graduates who had been delivered by Dr. Caudill to raise their hands, and it seems like you delivered half of our student body. But you know, they ran into a problem. If I didn't deliver them, there wasn't <laughs> anybody there. I guess that's true. Now, did you move from delivery in the home to delivery at a clinic or in your office, in office. later on? 1957, we, we built a office that I use now. And in that, we fixed a delivery room and two labor rooms. Mm -hmm. But at the time you began to deliver babies, there was no clinic as such, of course, or no hospital. No hospital. So home delivery is what was expected throughout the county. You have pointed out some of the complexities of delivering in a home. Are there advantages to home delivery? There seems to be a real movement toward at least an interest in home delivery these days. What accounts for that? What are the advantages of home delivery? Well, it's real fun to see a little one about three or four years old run around, and uh, they don't know what's going on, and they know everything's really exciting, and then the baby comes, and they want the baby, and you can give that little one the baby, and they'll take it and show it to its daddy and, and other brothers and sisters. It's a, it's a real thrill. A very homey, family-based yeah. situation. I'm the oldest of 12 kids, like I told you, and when I was born at home in 42, that was not unusual, but when the 12th was born at home in 62, that was unusual because the whole movement toward hospital births has taken place certainly in my lifetime. Of course, there are complications relating to childbirth and even enthusiasts for home delivery or natural childbirth realize that with complexities it's good to have the different equipment facilities that people have come to expect. What are some of the complications in childbirth? Bleeding is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. That's the one that scares you the most. Infection, of course, you can sort of manage that a little bit later on. But the real crisis mm -hmm. is uh, <coughs> is bleeding excessively before or right after delivery or some kind of position that you can't deliver. Mm -hmm. But you were <coughs> equipped to take care of excess bleeding 
in a home situation, I guess, with the equipment you had. We could give fluids, but we could not give blood. Mm -hmm. Blood's the only real replacement, and you could give them fluid. We always carried fluids with us. Mm -hmm. But uh, that isn't sufficient. That makes you scared to death. Right. Did you have a lot of breech births had in a home number. situation? But at that time, C-sections were not as common as they are today, I don't suppose. No, I don't think we had near as many. People worked a little harder at a breech birth than maybe they would today. All right. Did your training deal with a wide variety of delivery situations like breech birth? Yes, we had we had a great deal on that. And then I had a little fortunate uh, experience, too. A friend of mine that was a specialist in ob -Gen came and stayed with me for a month or two and went out in home deliveries and helped me. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like that she made me feel more secure. Mm -hmm. Because she could do anything. She was Chinese, and she had to do it right, all. <laughs> right. What other types of house calls were you expected to make in the late 40s? Of course, you would go out to deliver a baby, because that's where babies had to be delivered. But did people expect you to come to their house pretty much on call in the 40s? Or had the trend toward people coming into the office, as long as they could walk, uh, pretty much taken place? No, they waited until they could get in bed and you'd come see them. <laughs> okay. Because if they came to an office, they might run into problems. So they mm -hmm. wanted you to come see them. You'd go see them for pneumonia. <laughs> Lots of times you'd go to see them for pneumonia and they were going to have a baby, though. That <laughs> <laughs> get you mixed up. Right. But uh, you, uh, you'd go to see them for a big abscess. Mm -hmm. You'd go to see them for, oh, maybe a broken arm. Mm -hmm. they they didn't want you to come there for most everything. So at that time, the attitude was really that the doctor ought to come to the house rather than the patient coming to the doctor's office. Well, the, they didn't think the time was anything. Mm -hmm. And they didn't believe that doctors had hours. You, you were on call all the time, so you could go all night uh, uh, just as well as all day. Mm -hmm. For a minute, let's back up and talk about the days when you were a young girl. You went to Moorhead Normal School before the state even got involved with what became Moorhead State Normal School, I understand. I went up here through the first three grades. Right, and then you transferred to Moorhead, Moorhead grade, and then Round County High School, and Round County High is very proud, of course, to have you as a graduate. But when you were a young girl in the 20s, who were the family doctors that stand out in your mind? And how advanced would you say medical services were in Rowan County? Uh, people have always sort of looked down on Rowan County, but I think we were pretty good. Uh, when I was a kid, we had the Nicholses, mm -hmm. Dr. G.C. and Dr. Homer. Dr. Homer was a specialist in ENT. Mm -hmm. And we had Dr. Adkins. He was, uh, I think you talked by Bishop about him. Right. He was the only one that dispensed his own medicine. All the rest of them wrote prescriptions. Right. And then Dr. Evans was here then, but he didn't, uh, he didn't really doctor us. Now, Dr. Evans was in Farmers mm -hmm. for a time. Mm -hmm. but and then Dr. Skeggs was here. I better remember him because he delivered me. Mm -hmm. Right. But now, at that time, all doctors in Round County were in general practice and yes. taking care of a wide array of things. When did the public health service, what was called the county health department, first come to this area. Was that in the early part of the century? I think it was around 5, 6, somewhere along in there. 1905, 1906. And what types of services did the county health department render? Primarily it was uh, preventative medicine, mm -hmm. giving all kinds of shots for the children, primarily. And that was in public school as public well as... Public school and, and in the office. In the office. I know, I think Dr. Evans's office, when he was county health doctor here, mm -hmm. there used to be a state bank down on Railroad Street, and he had an office upstairs there. Mm -hmm. So the vaccination program for public school kids is fairly old in this county. Yeah, I remember when I got vaccinated myself, well, I was killed. So since the beginning of this century, at least, you know, vaccination program has been strong. Okay. Are there any epidemics or any outbreaks of disease or concern of disease in this county that you recall either in your lifetime or that you've heard about? Well, I, I sort of remember a little bit about the flu epidemic. I'm not too up on that, but uh, I can remember I had a cousin that died during that flu epidemic. Mm 
And what period of time was that? I think it was 1919. Okay, about 1919. Flu was a real killer at that time. Mm -hmm. But then we had two floods mm -hmm. in 33 and 39. Now those are later on things. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a great time to get all of the children their typhoid shots and the adults too. Mm -hmm. So everybody went to the health department, just lined up, and everybody got shot. Right. At the time you were in general practice in the 40s, and of course on through the 50s, when you needed a specialist or a surgeon, what did you do? What facilities were we dependent upon here in Round County? Most everybody went to Lexington, except now Dr. Jared, he sent most of his people to Ashland. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was sort of dependent. His brother was a surgeon in Ashland. Well, Dr. Blair sent a lot to Ashland because his uncle that was here went to Ashland. Mm -hmm. So it was between the two places. Mm -hmm. But you actually contacted a specialist or sent them to a specialist in Lexington, but any major surgery or any major illness illness that required very extensive testing or diagnosis had to be done in Lexington or Ashland. Those were the nearest major centers, I guess. Mm -hmm. Were people coming into Rowan County or being served from out of Moorhead uh, even before the hospital came. I'm talking now about outlying counties like Elliott and like Menifee, like Carter. Were you making home calls into those counties or did they have their own doctors? Uh, some places they had their own and sometimes we'd go. It mm -hmm. all depended. We've been up as far as Vanceburg, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. almost, uh, well, we, we did go to Olive Hill at a time. We've gone out towards Sand Hook, mm -hmm. down Salt Lake, Owensville. Just most any place. Right. Well, of course, all around Countyans are very pleased at this point that we do have a very good hospital and a couple of clinics. And as a result of that, we have become a center for medical services. Tell us about the coming of the hospital, just very briefly. What uh, interest was there locally to bring a hospital here? And what needs did it serve that otherwise weren't met locally from the beginning? I believe we've always been pretty progressive, mm -hmm. and everybody wanted a hospital. Uh, I, I, I brag a little bit when I say what I did, but uh, I was sort of against the hospital because I'd seen so many bad things happen in little hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, I just talked about this last night, but there was a fellow by the name of Dr. C.C. C. Howard. It came uh, up here the, the, to talk about having a hospital in Moorhead, and he agreed that you can have a good one in a little town. Mm -hmm. So when he made me believe that, I decided, well, if he says we can, by granny, we'll see if we can. So I, I figured there's about three things important. One was um, money, number one. Number two, somebody to run it. Number three, to make it accreditable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and things just rolled. You went to the town and you say, we need a pile of money. And everybody was willing to give. Everybody wanted a hospital. Right. And like we needed somebody to run it, uh, we figured the best hospitals uh, were run by churches. Mm -hmm. And we asked the various churches and nobody had any money until uh, the little Catholic priest says, I believe I can get you some money. Right. So uh, he managed to get that. And with that, he not only got us uh, some management, but he also knew how to get some Hill Burton money. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing that brought us in the Sisters of Notre Dame and uh, the money to get the building going. And I went to a meeting. I always will like rheumatic fever because of this incident. I uh, chose to go to this particular meeting and I happened to sit down by Dr. Segnitz. You may know him. He was the only pediatric surgeon in Kentucky at that right. time. Maybe. You met him. He's, he's a great guy. Right. And now he's, he's over in uh, Nevada or someplace over there on a reservation. Mm -hmm. Had to go take some OB from his son in order to do what he wanted to do over there. But anyhow, he, he was the fellow I sat down by. And I talked with him and uh, I said I wanted to find somebody that would come up here and be head of education and get us going on a good hospital. And I said, you don't know anybody like that, do you? And he said, well, I'd like to find somebody. And we left that meeting, and he was going on over to the hospital, and I just sort of tagged along. And I said, uh, uh, 
who would this be? What uh, could I do to find that person? He says, well, taste you. I just think about myself. <laughs> and um, so he came up here, and he took us over to uh, saw our situation, knew what our whole story was all about. And then he took me to Dean Willard and uh, Bob Johnson, Dr. Pellegrino, and all those people over to the, the medical school that were really in charge. And we talked over what we wanted. We wanted doctors here that would be qualified to work at their hospital. Mm -hmm. So they, they agreed that they would, I didn't know a good radiologist from a pathologist. Mm -hmm. So uh, they said they'd screen them for us and they'd give them one day a week to be on their staff down there. They could come and study, they could come and work, they could do whatever they wanted to. So in my mind, that answered a credibility. Right. So we had money, we had uh, people to run it, we had a credible way of getting people. And just like that, it fell in place. Right. Well, you say just like that, but in this whole story, I'm convinced that it took a tremendous amount of initiative leadership locally, a lot of it expressed by you. Uh, the kind of medical facilities we have here don't just happen. Uh, I think you're very modest in suggesting that it all unfolded because there has been a tremendous amount of leadership to bring it to pass. Now, the two clinics we have, of course, are independent from the hospital, mm -hmm. but I guess they have been developed as a direct result of the hospital we have here. At least they have been expanded to include a number of specialists as a result of the hospital. How many counties would you say we are serving primary at oh, this point in time? Well, we serve, I'd say, eight or ten uh, close by, but mm -hmm. most of them are from Carter. Carter is a very big drawing card. Lewis is a big drawing card. Elliot's a big bath. Menifee. So along with Lemon. Ashland, Moorhead is clearly the medical center for northeastern Kentucky, I guess. So it depends on whether you're closest to Lexington or Moorhead as to whether you come this direction and whether you're closest to Ashland or Moorhead coming this direction from the east of us. But is our patient load here in the county growing year by year, or have we pretty much reached a plateau at this time? And that's a bad time to ask that question. Mm -hmm. We're in a sort of a decline right now. Right. So uh, overall, I think we're growing, but we've had to close one floor of the hospital. So uh, right now, it, I don't think it's not because we're not drawn over mm -hmm. a wide enough area, but I don't think people have any money. But we hope that that's temporary. That, uh, we think that's temporary. Uh, is it true that the type of cases are the type of patients that you're dropping? Is it is it optional surgery, or are people just going to other places, or just having to pass up very critical medical needs? And people just not going. They mm -hmm. say, I can take this headache for a little longer. Right. So and they're they, really just not checking in. That's right. You know, something along those lines, a lot of journalists suggest, and some very responsible commentators and public analysts suggest that our whole society has come almost surgery happy. In other words, with the growth in specialists, with very capable surgeons and facilities, that there's an inclination to say, when in doubt, maybe you ought to go ahead with surgery. Is there any validity to that claim? Is it something we should be cautious of? Or is that an area where you just soon pass? <laughs> well, I pass because I don't want any. <laughs> right. No, I, I think they're being more critical of surgery. Um, and then that was one of the reasons that I had for not wanting a hospital mm -hmm. in a little town, is because I was afraid people were knife happy and cut when they shouldn't have cut. But I think the attitude's different today. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't want to be cut, you think about it and you say, well, let me go talk to Dr. So-and-so. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an acceptable practice. Mm -hmm. And I guess, really, if you have a number of doctors in the community, getting a second opinion is simpler rather than unlikely. So we do have an opportunity here with two clinics, I guess, to select both specialist and general practitioners as opposed to time in the past where our medical facilities were very, very limited. Let's talk about the new interest in medicinal herbs. You know, this is viewed as a part of Appalachian lore, you know, the old-timey use of herbs. 
and more and more with this back to the earth movement people are talking about medicinal herbs do you run into any of that today are people suggesting to you that some herbs might be worth using instead of prescribed medicines I have seen more of it in the last year than I ever heard of in all my life all of these educated uh, college students can come in and tell you what everything will do <laughs> they, they know more medicine than any doctor but every one of them has got a purpose uh, I haven't been able to find it in the literature uh, of the scientific nature mm -hmm. but uh, you can read it in the newspapers and various lay magazines mm -hmm. but, but the irony is you're saying that there's more talk of medicinal herbs in 1982 than there was in 1948. I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. What are some of the older ailments though? Are we just giving new names to old ailments? I used to hear of people having a bad case of the dropsy or dying of consumption. Are these diseases that have disappeared in much the same way leprosy did? Are they things that we've come with better terms for? We've come with different terms. I don't know whether they're better or not. Uh, we call Consumption, for example, is TB mm -hmm. or tuberculosis. And we don't have that like we used to have. We, we have uh, medications that will control tuberculosis. Dropsy is cardiac decompensation, mm -hmm. heart failure. And cardiac decomp is very, very prevalent. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was the cause of many, many nights loss of sleep and driving way out in the country. Right because they all knew they were going to die when they got so mm -hmm. far along. Right. Well, Dr. Caldwell, thank you very much. We've had a delightful discussion. You wouldn't believe our time's gone, would you? <laughs> we have a lot of other topics we could cover, but I'm going to have to say goodbye to our viewing audience, and we've been talking to Dr. Louise Caldwell, who's discussed with us the development of medical services in Round County, Kentucky. Thank you very much for joining us, and joining us again next week when we discuss another facet of our Appalachian culture and heritage.